Welcome, everyone. I am Dr. Debbie Rice, the Director of Clinical Education for Precision Analytical, creators of the Dutch Test. Thank you all so much for joining us today for our October webinar, Breast Health and Hormones, Going Beyond Cancer Prevention with Dr. Lauren Young. Today, Dr. Young will explore hormone testing and treatment options to optimize breast health. She'll also walk through some of the latest research so you can understand the basics of testing and discover protocols to help treat your female patient. Regarding our Dutch podcast, you can also listen to Dr. Young on the Dutch podcast this month, where she goes into greater detail about caring for female patients through an integrative approach to breast cancer, or I'm sorry, breast health. Tune in to the Dutch podcast each week on your favorite streaming app to hear insights from some of the brightest minds in functional medicine and explore new perspectives on integrative healthcare. Click the link we posted in the chat to learn more. If you're interested in becoming a provider, expert support and education is at the core of what we do. So we'd like to extend an invitation for you to become a registered Dutch provider today and access even more Dutch education. Registered providers gain access to the Mastering Functional Hormone Testing course, the Dutch Interpretive Guide, and one-on-one -on -one consultations with our Dutch clinical educators. Click the link in the chat to get started. Once you complete the provider application form, a member of our onboarding team will walk you through the steps to set up an account so you can be in taking advantage of all the education and resources Dutch has to offer. Now I have the honor to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Lauren Young studied health psychology at the University of Connecticut and was involved in research on cardiovascular health at the Yukon Medical Center. She received her doctorate in naturopathic medicine from the University of Bridgeport. Dr. Young worked in many integrative settings from acupuncture for detoxification at Lincoln Memorial Hospital to naturopathic care at Yale affi affiliated Griffin Hospital. She has worked in integrative settings side by side with gastroenterologists and other specialists offering evidence-based natural medicine to enhance conventional treatment and support the body's natural ability to heal. Her multi-specialty clinic resides in Manchester, Connecticut. However, she lectures extensively throughout New England in both public and professional arenas and writes extensively for public and professional journals. She regularly lectures on functional cardiology to physicians and has participated in Schwartz Grand Rounds for her work with oncology patients. Dr. Young is clinical faculty for the residency program at Manchester Hospital, teaching conventional physicians the importance of natural medicine for the University of New England. In 2018, Dr. Young became the first naturopathic physician to have privileges at Manchester Memorial Hospital, where she provides inpatient care. Such a great honor. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Dr. Young. We are thank ready you so when much you are. Me. Awesome. Thank you everyone for joining me and thank you to Dutch uh, for this opportunity. Um, so today we're going to dive into all things breast health and really talk about the um, importance of focusing on wellness, not just thinking about it from a cancer pers uh, prevention perspective. Um, with this, obviously we're gonna dive into hormones and especially estrogen and their metabolites. Um, and also how to then uh, modify hormones and improve breast health. So why are we talking about breast health? Um, breast cancer is uh, on the rise. It is extremely common. One in eight women in the United States will develop breast cancer. It is the number one um, largest cancer that happens to women. Um, and it is on the increase. The good news is that the death from breast cancer is on the decline because we are starting to develop some tools and, and certainly getting some better screening things that we're going to talk about in a minute. But there are a lot of women who are in recovery from a, an incident of breast cancer in remission, and those women are looking for prevention. And at the same time, we're looking of a reoccurrence, and we're also looking to prevent it going forward. So there's a lot of prevention talk around breast health. And so Part of that increase that we're seeing in women developing breast cancer, um, there's a myriad of different impacts to it. We're going to talk about why these are happening and how that is impacting our hormones and how that's translating into risk for cancer. Um, there is an increased exposure to what are called xenobiotics or basically exogenous forms of estrogen. Um, there's exogenous forms of estrogen sometimes used as therapy for hormone, hormone replacement therapy. Um, less women are becoming mothers, there's a delay in motherhood, and that delay in exposures to certain types of estrogen can increase your risk for breast cancer. 
And there's also an increase in uh, alcohol use and obesity. So these things put us more at risk. Um, the little graphs on the bottom there, uh, the one to the left is looking at uh, age of first time mothers in 1980. And then um, the second graph on the right is age of mothers um, in 2016. So basically women are having their pregnancies later, which means their breast tissue went longer getting exposed to a lot of estradiol. Like I said, one of the things we do really well when it comes to breast health is screening tools from teaching women self, um, self exams to um, regularly doing diagnostic imaging. This piece of things we're doing really well. I will take this one quick opportunity to share with you and I'm not gonna read it all to you. You have this as a resource in the slides that you can download, but with more gender affirm affirming care, which I think is really important, there is a um, group of people who may not be getting the screening they should be getting. So I um, just wanted to put on people's radar that transgender people may need um, more or less screening depending on hormone therapies they may be getting. So when we think of prevention when it comes to other health conditions, like for example, heart disease, screening is an important part, right? We do our echocardiograms, calcium scores, EKGs, stress tests, but then there's all these other tools we use, right? We're looking at advocating for lifestyle. We're looking at modifying risk factors, especially when it comes to markers in our blood. And so what I suggest is that we do something similar for breast health. We should be looking at what's going on with our breasts, whether it's pain, discharge. Okay, so the lump isn't cancer, but what, what is that lump trying to tell us and what's going on with our hormones that our breasts are trying to communicate to us? Um, currently, the model is, for this is from up to date, if someone were to have a breast lesion and they have a mammogram that is negative, this is the algorithm. If the, if the um, imaging is negative, just reassure the patient is the suggestion. And then if they're having symptoms, the recommendations are basically, if you want to read there, uh, it's, it's palliative. It's, it's basically taking care of the person's symptoms, giving them something to help with the pain, um, stopping HRT therapy because there is an acknowledgement that hormones are driving a piece of this. Um, I was actually pretty excited to see that even Primrose Oil made the, made the cut on up to date. So there is that recommendation. But then the next tier of recommendation essentially is tamoxifen, which is a very serious medication. It could be life saving and really important for some women. But in this scenario of um, fibrocystic breasts or non proliferative breast, benign breast diseases, Tamoxifen would not be my favorite choice. So there's a huge white space here for us to be able to step in and use functional medicine to offer a lot of different options for helping with um, benign breast diseases. So what are benign breast diseases? Let's dive into those and also talk about risk factors for those. It's so common to have fibrocystic breast disease that they're actually taking away the word disease and you just say fibrocystic breast because it's pretty much been normalized at this point. Um, there is no association with risk factors as far as um, irregular menses and things like that when it comes to breast disease. The biggest risk factors that we're familiar with are obesity, um, hormone replacement, um, and then a family history of breast cancer. Those things do put you at risk. Interestingly enough, oral contraceptives are typically not associated with um, fibrocystic breasts. There are several different types, and three main types actually, of fibrocystic breasts or, or um, proliferative um, benign breast conditions basically. So I'm not gonna read all these to you, you can read them. I mainly wanna have this as a resource for you. So that way when you look back and someone has you know, a fibroadenoma, which category did this fall into? Because essentially the categories are gonna dictate the level of risk for developing some kind of breast cancer down the road. Basically, it's a sign that there's the, the micro tissue in the breast is, is being aggravated by hormones is, is uh, what I'm going to suggest to you today. So non-proliferative, which is a lot of common breast cysts, which you hear about a lot, those are with a risk of breast cancer. So when someone comes back with an ultrasound or we're seeing these type of things, cysts are very common and they're not associated with any kind of risk of breast, um, breast cancer long term. Proliferative without atypia, this is a group that is going to have an increased risk of breast cancer. Um, these are wait and watches though. They're typically just looked at. Fibroadenomas are, are treated very similar. Like, you know, they're watched like cysts. Sometimes they're monitored a little more closely, especially if they have other risk factors associated with the patient. But this is something where they're not going to necessarily treat with any other 
medication, they're just going to kind of watch these lesions. And so this is something where we will be able to step in with these conditions because that is a you know, um, two times the risk of breast cancer when the risk is already one in eight is not, not a great number. And then atypia or hyperplasia, um, these are, we're really seeing some changes to the tissue and these are very high risk for developing um, breast cancer. Um, a lot of times this is, there'll be some other um, conventional treatments maybe suggested like tamoxifen or other medications like that. Um, certainly this is something that we would wanna keep an eye on as well. So all these different conditions are just considered benign, but at the same time, there's a level of risk for breast cancer. And really we're, what we're seeing is there's a lot of changes in hormones that we need to make sure we're paying uh, in breast tissue that we need to pay attention to. So stay with me guys. It gets more fun than this. <laughs> so I, when we look at breast tissue, it is very responsive to um, estrogen, which is like a no surprise. Everyone who has breast tissue and has a regular cycle notices there's a lot of changes with their cycle as their estrogens shift. So does their, like the the density of their breast tissue, sometimes the sensitivity of it. And so we know that estrogen is going to proliferate the tissue and promote growth. And so with that, it increases the risk of creating mutations. And with that accumulation of exposure to estrogens and increased proliferation, increases the risk of breast cancer. So we're really gonna explore the microenvironment, um, this hormonal microenvironment in breast tissue. Um, what we know from some of this research, and I kind of gave you the studies to kind of look back on if you're interested in, or if you're having a hard night sleeping, you could just pick one of these babies up and put it right out. But um, the, the highlights I want to share with you from some of these studies are basically that blood levels of, of hormones are not reflecting this micro environment. And so it's not a great read to be looking at blood levels of hormones typically. Um, and that when we look at estrogen receptors in some of these benign tissues, we're finding very high levels of estrogen receptors, which is something we also see in breast cancers and tumors that there's a higher amount of estrogen receptors when it's an ER positive breast cancer. So what we're seeing is, is that this growth is happening because of the hormones that are there. Essentially too, the other th thing we wanna be mindful of is breast density does increase a woman's risk of breast cancer. So if we're seeing that microenvironment is um, busy, then that means, again, more opportunity for mutations and a problem. So um, I often refer um, to busy breasts or what we're seeing, right? Like there's a lot of hormones there, there's a lot of growth, and that's not necessarily what we want to see. We want to see a balance with everything. And so when we're seeing breasts like this, we want to say, okay, what are we seeing? How is it related to cyclical hormones? How is it related to other symptoms? And this is an opportunity to really go, okay, this is when we want to look at doing a deep dive into what's going on with, for this micro um, environment. What are the hormones that are impacting this tissue? How can we kind of better support this woman to make sure that our hormones are better so we're not seeing this become an issue where there's potential for mutation and developing breast cancer? So much like you would see risk factors for cardiovascular disease, whether it's cholesterol or cardiac CRP or any of those other markers, you would go after those long before you're seeing any changes to the actual tissue. The tissue is already saying some changes. Let's get on helping reduce these risk factors. So these are like my, I hope you guys like my AI generated photos. I had fun with them. Um, much like AI, there's probably good things and bad things. I feel like, you know, it's easy to not like estrogen because we know that there are risk factors. When it comes to breast cancer, we get very nervous with estrogen. But I want to remind us that estrogen is amazing at supporting bone growth, body development, mental health, balancing neurotransmitters, nervous system. You know, the, it's incredibly important for us. And so um, we're going to enjoy all the estrogens and kind of talk about each one of them separately and, and how important they are in the body. Uh, the AI is kind of bizarre if it doesn't do face as well. So I thought you guys would get a kick out of this. So estradiol. Um, she is definitely the one that's most out there, the strongest. Um, she is predominantly the one that we have prior to menopause and, um, and is the more, the most aggressive of them all. Most of this comes from our ovaries. Uh, and so her, the next in line would be estrone. And, um, this is more associated with, um, you know, peripheral conversion, um, 
after menopause is when she really shines. Um, she's, she can convert back into estri um, estradiol and consider the weakest of the estrogens. So this is after menopause. She's the one that's kind of kicks in gear from your adrenal glands and your adipose tissue. Um, a little bit comes from your ovaries, but um, she, she's our, our weak one that, that, but then takes the, takes the lead once we're in menopause. And estriol, she um, is the reason why we're finding pregnancy to be so uh, protective against breast tissue. And we'll talk about why in a second. So she is a, another weak estrogen, but um, is, has a lot of affinity for the beta estrogen receptors um, and is very high during pregnancy. So um, oftentimes we utilize um, estriol during when we're using bioidentical hormones. Um, I love this chart because it kind of helps you understand that there's different types of estrogen receptors and then looking at all our major players and how they have affinity for certain receptors. So estrogen receptor alpha is mainly in breast tissue, uterine, ovarian, um, bone, uh, liver, and adipose tissue. So this is more what we're going to be talking about when we're focusing on um, breast health is really this estrogen um, receptor alpha. Estrogen receptor beta is more in um, bladder, ovary, colon, adipose tissue, and immune system. And I would say um, cardiovascular and nervous system actually have receptors for both. So when we're looking at, um, just to kind of like have you orient you around this, like the est estradiols have an aggressive association with alpha, the, the breast tissue uh, receptors, compared to the estriol, which is substantially weaker, and even estrone, which is um, weaker as well. All right, so estrogen metabolism uh, uh, is then where the next piece of things we're going to look at is the metabolites and how these three estrogens are broken down even more and how that can kind of impact our risk for breast cancer, breast health, and how it affects that uh, microenvironment in, as far as prol proliferation and growth. This research started back in 1982, and I'm giving you guys a timeline for a reason, I promise, so stay with me with it. So essentially, we started finding that there's these different metabolites, and there are different associations when it comes to breast cancer. We start to extrapolate more over the years that we're finding that there's several different types of uh, metabolites, 2, 4, and 16, and that they have different impacts when it comes to damage to the cells and creating proliferation and stimulating growth, but also mutations. We start developing this, and there's even more study than this. I'm just kind of giving you a little bit of a timeline around it all. Um, we're seeing that there's a ratio essentially. So if you have more of the two compared to the 16, we're noticing correlations with uh, increased risk for tumors in, in mice in some cases, and then we're finding it in women later on. We're also finding that um, chemicals in our environment are increasing certain uh, of the metabolites. So the 16, the more cancer promoting uh, metabolite we're finding is upregulated by certain uh, organochlorines and um, different environmental toxins. So we're starting to know these correlations. And as we know, correlation doesn't mean causation. So we keep building off of that, but we're finding more and more impacts with um, better outcomes with a, a better ratio of two to 16. And then in 1999, we actually started finding that uh, certain nutrients in uh, cruciferous vegetables, which we'll be diving into it ad nauseum, so uh, that that those can actually impact the risk of it all. So we started really going, okay, here's this other marker that we can start following, seeing associations with risk factor, and we can modify it by either helping prevent um, exposure to chemicals or helping support detox, supporting that cytochrome so P450 pathway, um, or else also, um, you know, offering up some support through cruciferous vegetables or supplements. So this all looked really great, um, but it's like one of those things where we're building this construct. It sounds like this really great story. Oh my gosh, is this, this good, too good to be true? Could we really be modifying a, a risk factor for breast cancer and bre helping with breast health? All these other studies came out around the same time, well, a little after that. Um, where there was no association. So we see all these correlations. Now we're seeing a bunch of other studies that did not replicate the um, research. And some of them are quite big, right? So like the one was with 25,000 Danish women and they found that there was no association. If anything, sometimes the opposite, the research was all over the place. 
so I, I'm my hubris, but I put myself on the timeline because this is about when I left um, naturopathic medical school. And I was taught at the time, like, you know what, this is not research. This is the technology is not here yet. We're not capturing, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag. It's what I was kind of taught at the time. Um, and there was a lot of research and talk about it at the time, the same kind of issue where it's like, you know, it's contradictory sometimes and it's not consistent and that's going to be an issue. What um, has kind of come of late, and I know some of um, my mentors have been public about it and like looking at it, is when you drill down even further at the research, there actually is a reason why those previous studies were not in line with the rest of the data that we've been seeing, seeing that two to 16 ratio being so therapeutic and protective. Essentially, there's two ways of looking at this two to 16 ratio. There's using, and this is not, I am not a lab kid, I'm definitely a clinician, so pardon me if I'm butchering any of this. And, um, but like essentially these enzyme immunoassays that were done with a lot of the studies that were basically not statistically significant or inconsistent with the rest of the data are not nearly as accurate as doing um, you know, mass spectrometry, which is kind of the gold standard. So basically um, I kind of changed my tune on it. And I think a lot of other people did as well when we realized that when you look at all the data around liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry, then all the data is consistent that these two to 16 ratios are very protective of um, breast cancer, which is what this is saying right now. So there's a lot of research around this and there's a couple of big memes that were doing a lot of the research showing that if we basically look at these pathways of estrogen metabolites, we can really um, modify a risk factor for breast cancer. So I, Gave you all that history to say, like in the past, if you went to school around the same time I did, um, you may have been told oh, these metabolites don't really mean anything or it's inconclusive or it's still the research, you know, the data is still not there. I think the data is here at this point, and it's really about using the, the more accurate form of testing. So let's back. I, I backed into that. Now we're going to go and talk to about the actual estrogen metabolites and what they're about and from there, we'll talk into how to modify them. So hello, uh, more AI. Sorry, they're a little scary, but um, I was really proud of myself for getting a two and a four and a 16 on these ladies. To give you an idea, you know what, you're not gonna forget them. If you're a visual person, you're gonna remember which one's good and which one's scary, right? So um, we've got our um, two hydroxyesterone. This basically has been shown to be very weak when it comes to um, um, ER, um, alpha uh, beta binding affinity. So it's basically not going to promote growth. If anything, it's protective when it comes to cell pro proliferation. So um, she's our good guy. Still kind of scary in the face. Uh, sorry, that's the best AI could do. Um, four is associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. Um, so we don't like four at all either. Um, and it's found in um, increased uh, preparations of um, adenocarcinomas as well. So they're finding it potentially with um, thyroid cancer. Um, and it's just considered overall less stable, less and more reactive, less safe. She looks less safe. But then 16 is the real bad boy. Like we, we don't, um, we're just finding a um, dramatic increase in proliferation of breast cancer tissue when we're seeing um, a high level of 16. So that's kind of the, those are the major players that we got from all of that research over the timelines, basically the 1980s that we've been watching these, these major players um, as far as estrogen metabolites. So the goal is, is that pie chart, right? Is like, I, I love the way this is always um, presented because it's so easy to explain to patients. We've got our, our three estrogens along the top and then we're seeing how they're metabolizing. Um, by those certain pathways, which is great. And we really just wanna make sure we're getting that pie chart in a spot where we've got a lot of good um, of two and less of the 16 and definitely less of the four as well, but really focusing on the getting that two up there. Um, and we have lots of tools to be able to do that. So we're gonna talk about those. A couple little quick things. I didn't find any research around just doing HRT, like um, the HRT therapy, so doing bioidentical and, and urinary um, estrogen metabolites, it would be interesting because again, some of these like more weaker estrogens being utilized might be something interesting to look into. Also, um, according to the research and I, everything I was seeing, it doesn't really matter when you do the metabolite testing. It can be done anytime in a woman's cycle, premenopause. So it's not like 
you're, you have, the estrogen metabolites are going to fluctuate the same way our estrogen levels do. So when you're doing this test, um, oftentimes you may still be doing it at a certain time of the month because you're trying to capture those estrogens as well. But from a metabolite perspective, it's not something that we have to watch um, where someone is in their cycle, which can be really helpful when a woman has had an ablation or has had a hysterectomy. We're not beholden to like kind of guessing at where she is in her cycle. Um, I love all these charts because they can kind of keep giving you visualization. So whatever one speaks to you, feel free to print it out. And I, I'll, I'll show you my favorite in a few minutes. Um, but essentially, we have these options, these shoots and ladders that our body can, can shunt this estrogen into its metabolites. And there are ways to modify this. And that's what we're really going to be stepping in and doing, because this is what's going to help that microcosm of breast tissue that to keep it safer, to keep it less stimulated by um, estrogens and having it prevent breast cancer. So right there. So how we modify our risk? We're going to reduce our exposure. Um, we're gonna support estrogen detox. Um, and we're gonna make sure you have enough progesterone, which is in and of itself its own thing. But what we found is that, as you know, you'll see it in some of these slides, progesterone in of itself can be this like nice, nice nurturing little sister that can kind of say like, hey, do this, make this good decision, make that good decision. So um, adequate progesterone could be its own thing in and of itself to help kind of support estrogen making its right choices as it goes down the chutes and ladders of metabolism. So we're talking about estrogen detox. Again, we're going to be upregulating, the, especially the, the two pathway. Um, and then from there also decreasing the, this. So upping the two, decreasing the 16 is going to be what helps improve your ratio. And then additionally, we're going to help with adequate methylation to avoid any kind of like um, conversions um, there. And then additionally, looking at glutathione to help kind of with any like free radicals and um, reactive estrogens that are happening while we're moving stuff around. So um, this is our fun phase one, phase two, looking at our liver detox pathways, which we'll be chatting about with it when it comes to this. Um, but before we even go to that, we want to talk about to the colon. So once we kind of chop everything up and bubble wrap it. We're going to put it into our GI tract. We want to make sure that we're actually clearing our estrogens from our system. And one thing we want to look at that is not necessarily done with the estrogen metabolites, but if you're doing this testing and we're seeing things off, this is something you want to do with almost like a secondary test, or you may want to make sure these things are in place. Make sure people's gut health is good if you're trying to detox them. I mean, I know this is 101, but it's super important. So this beta glucuridase activity basically deconjugates the conjugated estrogen leading to reabsorption. So that's going to mean that we're not clearing the estrogen that we just worked to get out of our system. Um, and so there's two things that really help influence beta glucuronidase, and that's bifidobacterium and calcium deglucurate. So making sure those things are there to help lower beta glucuronidase levels is important because if we're going to do all this work on the front end to make every sure everything goes in the right chutes and ladders, we got to make sure it clears out of the system after that. So I would say, you know, you can certainly test beta glucuronidase. Um, you can put these other things in place to make sure we're supporting that pathway. And um, also just regular bowel movements and making sure you have gut, gut lining integrity. That's going to be really important for, I feel like you can't talk clearing estrogen or hormones or anything without making sure you have a good gut health. This is my favorite one, guys. I could look at this all day long. I actually have it printed out in our, like, we call it Doc Alley. And um, you could just nerd out on this for days. It's just such a great slide that gives you so much information. We're going to do a deep dive in this corner. I want to talk about this at length. So um, this is this is where we're going to basically be modifying a lot of our um, our risk factors right here. And so if you want to zoom in and look at right underneath the four, basically what upregulates the two. What we're seeing is um, basically cruciferous vegetables, dim and three carbonyl, we're about to talk about that. Watching caffeine, soy, um, actually caffeine I think upregulates it in this scenario in a good way. Um, um, so there's a lot of different things there, right? There's um, omega-3s and making sure your thyroid is healthy. A lot, thyroid alone can actually be a, a protective thing for this and upregulating um, your two to 16 ratio. Uh, also being careful of um, alcohol and sugar, because that's going to, I mean, if you look where everywhere alcohol and sugar are, it's nothing, nothing good comes from it. The other thing we want to look at, so there's that one pathway of looking at how we can move things that way. 
if you look above the 16, there's also things that are basically going to keep you from going down the 16 pathway. So especially of note is like antimicrobials, um, like, like an antifungal, which is really interesting. And I wonder if that isn't related to gut health or maybe it has to do with uh, liver metabolism. Um, but then also wild yam and why is that again, progesterone can help estrogen make good choices. So that's a thing to be mindful of. Um, and uh, again, antioxidants are going to play a really important role with all of this too. So, uh, you know, when you're looking at a patient and you're looking at their lifestyle, my, the point of me point look really focusing on the slide is that we can give them supplements. Yes. If they're taking their indole three carbonyl, but if they're smoking, drinking a lot of alcohol, having a lot of caffeine, if their um, BMI is off, if their diet's not great, we're going to be fighting a battle here. So it is lifestyle medicine, as well as looking at these um, phytonutrients that can really make a big difference. One thing I wanted to do a deep dive on is like, you know, the indole free carbonyl versus them debate. I think everyone has their different opinions on it. So I just wanted to like explain to you, like, so we know that cruciferous vegetables have this um, the substance in it called indole 3 carbonyl, which comes from when the glucobrass um, and <laughs> basically an enzyme breaks up these phytonutrients. And um, when the, basically the cell wall breaks, it allows this enzyme to jump in and break up in, into these all, a whole bunch of phytonutrients, one of them being indole 3 carbonyl. Um, this is actually a protective mechanism for the plants because many animals think bitter is poisonous or not safe. And so um, a lot of these cruciferous vegetables have more of a bitter flavor to them because of this process, this um, uh, chemical reaction that happens that creates that makes the food more bitter, basically when it gets um, broken up and chopped up when you break up that cell wall. One of these products being indole 3 carbonyl. Indole 3 carbonyl is what um, then becomes dim once it hits your stomach acid. And that is the active component that um, the DIM is what actively converts um, that and, you know, to promotes the two to 16 ratio to improve, promotes that one pathway to upregulate the, the two pathway. So there's two schools of thought with this, right? And I'm not going to like weigh in on one side or the other, but there's like the indole 3 carbonyl is what's actually found in the plant. DIM is what we're finding that's actually the active component that we'll oftentimes measure in blood when we're doing these things. Um, indole 3 carbonyl is relatively unstable um, and typically converts to DIM, but not exclusively converting to DIM, but it is the more natural of the substances. That's, that's the difference between the two of them. Um, so that, I thought that was kind of a fun deep dive. We also want to talk about reducing endocrine disruptors. So a lot of things to mimic estrogen in our environments. And that's another huge reason why we're having this uptick of estrogen related cancers is that we just have so much more that we have to clear through our systems compared to our ancestors. Um, one that's not on this list that I should have added, but uh, I'm adding it now as I talk to you guys is glycophosphates. So there are a lot of things in our environment that are going to upregulate uh, our burden of estrogen and then also going to be impacting our, our breast tissue for sure. So making sure we're avoiding these things as much as possible. Um, you know, I think a lot of this stuff we're getting better about like bisphenol A, but there's still a lot of canned goods that'll have lining in the um, um, inside of the can that's bisphenol A. So watching for BPA products, you know, trying to get things as processed. I mean, all the stuff we know, but it really does make a huge difference when it comes to breast health. Um, I love EWG.org, um, which is environmental working group. Um, and they basically do a lot of patrolling of exposure to chemicals. They, they're the ones who come up with the dirty dozen exposure to, uh, pesticides, including glycophosphates. Um, and so this would be, that'd be a great resource for everyone to check out if you haven't already, um, making sure you're just reducing your exposure to plastics in general, because I know we're reducing BPA in our plastics, but gosh, there's a lot of chemicals and all this stuff. Um, I had the privilege of taking uh, environmental medicine with uh, Walter Kernian, who was just an amazing advocate for environmental medicine. And I remember all of us just were like only glass and stainless steel after that, you know, so um, a lot more Pyrex in our lives after that. So I highly recommend trying to stay with that as well. Um, and, you know, there's definitely a lot of stuff out there these days for uh, making sure makeup and cleaning supplies and those things just don't have any endocrine disruptors in them as well. 
um, EWG again is a great resource for those. So we were talking about um, supporting CMT as one of the things. Let's, I want to back up really quick. So if we look down below. There's the making sure the um, two pathway gets supported um, with COMT along that bottom line. And there's a bunch of things that help kind of do that, especially B vitamins and magnesium. Um, one thing that people often will say is that they started DIM or indole 3 carbonyl and they get headaches or they don't feel good. Typically that's because they're not methylating well. And so you may want to look at supporting COMT pathway, that one right down below, before getting into um, adding or in concomitantly while you're adding in your DIM and indole 3 carbonyl because that's going to be a beneficial support um, to make sure you're going you're going to set the woman up for success or the the, the person with breast for success so um the interesting thing with um comt i think it gets a lot of attention around methylation so there's certainly b vitamins um and and uh, b6 and folate have been shown to be helpful Magnesium, so this is, um, the, the green is a supportive um, substance and the tan is actually more of an antagonist. And the further out it is, is not how strong it is, it's just the more research there is on how it is impacting um, the CM, CMT. So looking at this, basically the, the little ones at the bottom, I wouldn't go extrapolating out and saying people have to avoid uh, cannabis, but maybe, because that's, I mean, there's lots of reasons for that, but um, it's more just like that could be something that's inhibiting COMT's pathway. I thought it was interesting to see rhodiola and green tea being in the ones that are more antagonist pathways. So if you've got someone who is really sensitive and you know, right now you can only have them doing broccoli sprouts, but you really love them on dim or indole 3 carbonyl, we're not seeing their two to 16 ratio improve. We might wanna look at what else they're doing just to see if they can support it in some way. Um, so I, I did want to share a case with you. Um, this is an AI photo of her, but I feel like this does look like her. Um, she's been my patient for quite some time um, and saw me, through, uh, saw her for her first case of breast cancer. And then actually um, her, her more recent uh, reoccurrence of breast cancer. Um, and she had no previous family history, which I will say is about 70 to 80% of women do not have a family history or genetic reason for their exposure, for their incidence of breast cancer. So most of it is just not associated with that. Um, but she you know, had her children fairly young. Um, she had a nice lifestyle. She was fairly like you know, healthy um, body composition. Um, and so yeah, A plus for diet, sleep and exercise. She really unremarkable health history otherwise. Um, so we were kind of doing a, a deep dive as to why. Um, so we had done, after her first case of um, breast cancer, she had stopped her um, aromatase inhibitors. We decided to do the dried urine testing and found that she had a four to 16 ratio. We also did a deep dive to do beta glucuronidase testing. She had started on her supplements and we kind of got complacent because she's, you know, five, 10 years out from breast cancer. We had her on um, DIM, we had her on all these things. She she was not great at taking pills, so she would open all these capsules up or crush the tablets every day. But she would make her little green shake every day, and she would add these all in. And this is kind of we we got into a routine of it. And I, you know, I didn't retest her because she had been doing well. She was taking all the stuff, you know, that kind of thing. So we kind of got complacent to a capsule a day of the basics, supporting COMT with the magnesium, um, and all the great pathways. And I was, you know, I was a good naturopath. She hadn't had a reoccurrence of breast cancer, pat myself on the back. Then this reoccurrence happens and we decided she want, we wanted to retest before she was gonna go back on to letrozole just for our own peace of mind because she really had a hard time with the idea of why did this happen again? And I was like, I don't know, we were doing everything right. When we retested, we actually found that her beta-glucuronidase was still elevated and her two to 16 ratio was not where we wanted it to be. And I bring this story up, um, she's doing well, she's, you know, she's doing great. She's, uh, you know, this is a couple of years out now and she's tolerating the letters all well and doing wonderful. But we were complacent in that, like we, were, we did the protocol that was supposed to do all these things, but retesting is important because people are unique and their pathways are unique and we wanna make sure we're getting that therapeutic place. And so, um, you know, 
I would recommend that once you start someone on a protocol, deciding a timeline of when we're going to retest that um, just to make sure they're going the right direction. Um, so in summary, we're looking at we can really protect breast tissue by not just doing prevention in that we're screening, but really prevention in that we're being proactive at what the breast's experience is on a tissue level. Is it getting a lot of hormones? Is it getting a lot of stimulation? Are we supporting detox from the colon to, you know, all the metabolites and how we um, address that? This really is something that we should be having a conversation with most women about. I think breast health is very, um, it's normalized to have fibrocystic breasts, right? And it's normalized to have pain with your cycle. And it's normalized to, you know, you get a mammogram, it's good. Just reassure the patient and they're good now. If there's a, it's not, it's not a mass, then you're good. So I think this is an opportunity for us to start really looking and saying, this tissue is highly sensitive to estrogen receptors, especially those alphas. This is a great opportunity for us to get proactive. And, and I'm excited at where the research is going. And I'm excited that this is such a great tool that I uh, did not give enough credit to when I was in school, but I absolutely love having it in my practice now. So thank you so much for listening. I talked really fast, but I'm excited to um, connect with you all on Instagram uh, live if, if you guys have questions. Um, and I'm eager to uh, keep this conversation going about supporting breast health. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation. I know we um, have ended just a little bit early, so I was going to see if I could sneak in a couple of questions that will warm you up for the Q and A. Yeah. Um, Overall, for everyone um, in attendance, and that we'll see this later, we will be doing a live Q&A on Instagram next Wednesday, October 25th at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Um, you can follow at Dutch Test to get all the updates and join us to have your questions answered by Dr. Young live. Um, the other thing, you did a really great uh, review of all of the, you know, like the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the mm -hmm. two and the 16 and the four. Um, and I would just love to hear like what you have to say. I feel like there's been a lot of literature about the two to 16 ratio. And then we kind of sneak in a 4OH. When you're looking at the two to 16 ratio, do you have... Um, I know that you like to have a certain ratio. Is there one like a goal that you are looking for when you're looking at the two to 16 ratio? Yes, and it's in one of my slides. Let me see if I can pull it back up. And it was based off oh, of, yeah. Um, Great. It basically pulled from a bunch of different, uh, basically there was a study showing the relative risk associated with it. So, um, and I do, I, I will say probably like a lot of people, like it's so nice to have these, um, the the numbers kind of spelled out for you when as far as expected ranges and that type of thing. But yeah, um, you, you want to see ideally, like the more you can get the the two towards the 80%. So then like the, the ratio would be um, greater than 3.29 is ideal. Um, I can, okay. I, if it's on, I can like push you guys to like, I'm really just reading numbers to you. I wonder if I could share my screen again. It was complicated the first time, but yeah, over 3.29 for uh, 2 to 16 ratio was like a reduce the relative risk dramatically um, in the one study. And then another study found that like at least over 1.9 for the ratio. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. For that. And then I know, I don't know if you get a lot of these questions on DIM and I3C. Um, I love that you walked through all of that because I feel like the I3C is like the little party that's happening. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we hope that the party goes down the you know right road. Yes. Um, so is it do you generally like in looking at your case study, you had talked about DIM. Is that do you prefer DIM over I3C? And is there do you have more of an opinion on that? Um, it's funny because I feel like I'm standing on the shoulders of giants with this because I know there's like several right. like really <laughs> yeah. like knowledgeable uh, functional medicine docs in the community and I see them both stand on, on both sides. Yeah. I lean towards like because especially since I've been more about testing retesting lately um, in the past probably five years I've really gotten aggressive especially that one case like woke me up yeah. to like seeing the outcomes is it improving and I personally do see dim do really well with it 
but like I said, That's I have great. some colleagues who I really respect who are on the other camp. Yep. Um, so I, I yeah. think both of them same. are there. Yeah. 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 Have same. Okay. Cool. Uh, same thing where there are some people that are like I3C and then other people are like dim. And so this is where I'm always like, ah, uh, you know, like I just like to hear people's experience and, and what they, what more information they also gather in the differences between like the I3C and the dim and, and what that looks like. So thank you for yeah, walking. I, I ended up on team dim. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I do also like that you talked about like the calcium deglucurate and the beta glucuronidase. I think um, when you do any of the hormone testing, do you find it general practice that you like to also do stool testing or does it just kind of depend on your patient population? I, I usually out the gate say like, look, if we, I would rather you spend some money on some testing just so that we can get this information and decide is this something we have to go after or not. So yeah. I will out the gate do beta glucuronidase with that and um, estrogen metabolites. That's kind of my go-to because, and I tell them like, look, this may be a one and done if they look good and I feel okay with it. Yep. There was one study yep. I should reference that like said that, um, you know, there, obviously there's a lot of studies showing that like estrogen metabolites in urine is like kind of the gold standard for testing these, but they were saying that like, you know, if you see a lot of substantial changes to your cycle, you should consider retesting, especially like a three-year marker was like their suggestion from the researchers that yeah. like it may, like you, you know, if like you were good in your like thirties, but then all of a sudden you hit perimenopause and your cycles are getting really wonky and you do have a family history, history, or like you start having symptoms and maybe you prudent to retest, but otherwise, like I would yeah. say those two tests out the gate are really, they give us so much information. It's such different information. You kind of just explain to people, it's like a CMP and a CBC. We need both of them to see the full picture, yeah. you know? And I love, I feel like that's really, um, affirming information to hear that it's good to, you know, get that hormone testing and stool testing. And you talked about the gut microbiome, which is a huge factor when it comes to just overall health and immune function. So that was great. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, and in closing, um, please everyone check your inboxes tomorrow for a link to the webinar recording and to download the slides that were presented today. Additionally, please visit the Become a Provider tab at dutchtest.com and complete the steps to become a provider so you can gain access to all the fun stuff that we have, our educational resources, and we have all sorts of information um, uh, with regard to like research with those additional resources. We are so happy you were able to join us today. And thank you so much, Dr. Young, for sharing your education and experience with us. It's invaluable. Thank you so much. Thank you.